so um, uh, with that, I think I'm going to advance one more slide, and I get to um, introduce Mary Cushman, who I think many of you know. Um, uh, uh, Mary's a professor of medicine and pathology at University of Vermont uh, College of Medicine, and she's director of the thrombosis and hemostasis program at University of Vermont. And I get to read some really uh, neat things about uh, Mary. And I told her she looks terrific in the red dress. She's ready uh, for us here in preventive cardiology. So uh, Mary completed her medical school residency and fellowship all at the University of Vermont in uh, Burlington, and then she went to Harvard uh, and got a master's in epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health, kind of like I did over at, uh, at Michigan. And um, uh, Mary is actually a hematologist, and she uh, is in the Division of Hematology Oncology at the University of Vermont, and she directs a thrombosis and hemostasis uh, program. And uh, she's been very involved in NIH uh, studies, and she's led them. She's had uh, over uh, 20 years of continuous NIH funding. Any of you who've gotten an R01 know how much work that is to just administratively uh, get, that, get those over the finish line. Uh, she's a fellow of many of the societies, including the AHA, and as a hematologist, she's actually led many of our councils and given guidance on our councils uh, over the course of time. And uh, Mary's won many awards. Uh, including a Senior Researcher of the Year at the Fletcher Allen Healthcare Center, Distinguished Achievement Award in Epidemiology uh, and Prevention from the AHA. And most importantly, uh, Mary has uh, been a key in this REGARD study, which is an NIH cohort study, which is uniquely balanced between Caucasians and African Americans. It's very rich with data. We're going to learn uh, more about the REGARD study uh, tonight with her presentation. Uh, she has over 400 peer-reviewed uh, publications. She doesn't look old enough to ha have uh, 400 papers. And she's been cited over 50,000 times by others. Uh, the H index, I don't know if anybody knows this, but the H index is kind of the impactfulness of it. That means the average paper that uh, Mary published is cited by others 91 times, which is really amazing. So I'll stop here and introduce Mary Cushman and ask her to uh, take us through the next talk about um, LPPLA2 and cardiovascular risk. Thank you, Peter, um, and thanks for that great talk. It was really informative. So um, during this um, talk, I'm going to review the evidence for the association of LPPLA2 levels with cardiovascular risk, and as Peter pointed out, share with you some new data from the Reasons for Geographic and Racial Differences in Stroke Cohort Study, or REGARDS. And then I'd like to share with you uh, my thinking and some of our work on other potential applications for this assay. So th these are data from uh, individual participant meta-analysis uh, that I was able to participate in and published in 2010, pooling together uh, multiple cohort studies, so observational studies where baseline risk factor information is obtained and participants followed over years of follow-up. And in, in these examples, we have on the left a measurement of LPPLA2 activity at baseline and on the right measurement of the LPPLA2 ELISA, or I'll call it mass, um, on, the, um, on the right. And um, these um, analyses involved each 17 studies for activity and 18 studies for mass, including tens of thousands of participants and over 5,000 um, events of coronary heart disease. And what you can see is across increasing levels of LPPLA2 um, on the x-axis, it's categorized into quintiles. Each red square you see is each increasing quintile has a ratio of events. And you see for the fifth quintile compared to the first for activity a relative risk of 1.7 and for mass a relative risk of 1.6. Now these studies included both participants with and without baseline cardiovascular diseases. So it's kind of a mix from the clinical perspective, maybe not as useful as you, when you have a patient sitting in front of you because you've got a mix in these studies of people with and without baseline disease. But, but this was really the first definitive evidence pooling together multiple studies on this association. When you adjust further for um, other risk factors, um, you see some attenuation of of this risk relationship, but still a significant association of LPPLA2 activity and um, mass with coronary heart disease outcomes. Now, this analysis separates 
um, people based on um, whether they had previous coronary disease or not. So on the top, you see the results for the activity level. And this is now, instead of the top versus the bottom quintile, it's the relative risk or the hazard ratio per every standard deviation increment higher value of LPPLA2. And so for activity, you can see um, the first row um, of data are people who had no history of coronary heart disease prior to entry into the studies. And the second row is people who had stable coronary heart disease at the entry to the study. And so you see among those, um, for this version of the activity assay, which is the older generation activity assays, you'll hear more about the different assays uh, from Dr. Blick, that there really was no association um, in, among 16,000 people with 1,500 coronary disease endpoints. There was no association of uh, LPPLA2 activity, the hazard ratio being 1.03. Um, for mass, conversely, um, on the bottom, you see in the first row on the bottom um, graph, among those without a previous history of coronary heart disease, a relative risk of about 1.1 per standard deviation higher LPPLA2. Um, and then among those with stable disease, uh, a relative risk just a little bit higher. So this, this finding led to some confusion about whether the activity of LPPLA2 um, was valid as a predictor in those without a prior history of cardiovascular disease. Um, these are new data just published um, in the past few months from our lab uh, using data from the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis. Now this is another um, observational cohort study and it's funded by NHLBI. Um, in this analysis, we had 6,800 people from four race ethnic groups who were enrolled starting in around 2000 and have been followed um, over time for coronary, um, coronary heart disease and stroke outcomes. And here we have the data for, for incident coronary events. So on the top, you see all coronary heart disease events, so that includes MI, uh, fatal and non-fatal MI, and revascularization events with 358 events. And these are also the hazard ratios per standard deviation higher LPPLA2. And you can see in both model one and then model two, which is additionally adjusted for measures of subclinical atherosclerosis, um, robust relationships of the activity, both the activity and the mass with um, CHD outcomes. The bottom portion of the table shows what we call hard CHD outcomes. So these are fatal and non-fatal MI outcomes. And so there's less events, of course. With 223 events, um, you see even stronger relationships. Um, so 1.2 to 1.3 fold increased risk per SD increment. The reason this finding is really interesting is that the relationship persisted regardless of the level of subclinical ath atherosclerosis the people had. Remember, these people are all healthy at the beginning without any clinical disease, but many of them have subclinical disease like coronary artery calcium or a thickened um, internal or common carotid artery. So um, striking data um, and also um, suggesting that it could, that this biomarker can potentially add to the information you have from subclinical disease if you were to measure it in your practice. So to summarize what we have to, to this time, um, some confusion about the relationship of LPPLA2 activity with the risk of first coronary events. Um, and all the data I showed you had very little uh, available in African Americans. And we know African Americans have a higher risk of fatal coronary events and of stroke, but very little data available uh, on LPPLA2 in African Americans. Um, and very little data from studies that really were started in the, in the statin era. So in the time frame where people were getting statins, Peter reviewed a lot of the older data, say from the ERIC study, for example, um, and in that study, uh, it started in the late 1980s, no one was on statins at the beginning, and so now um, it's really a different world. So we need to understand um, whether this biomarker would predict um, in the setting of prominent statin use. And um, all the data I showed you to date were, was based on older activity assays, assays that were not automated, so maybe less precise in their measurement of LPPLA2 activity. So our hypotheses going forward um, in the project I'm gonna share with you now were that higher LPPLA2 would be associated with first time CHD risk independent of other factors, and that results wouldn't differ um, depending on what age group you were, uh, whether you were black or white, and whether you were a man or a woman, that the associations would be robust across all those subgroups. 
So regards, again, stands for reasons for geographic and racial differences in stroke. And uh, we initiated this study in 2003 and enrolled 30,239 African American and white adults age 45 and older. We recruited them originally, or initially by telephone, then did a computer assisted telephone interview to get uh, medical data and uh, demographic information. And then participants were seen in their homes all across the country. Um, because by the title of the study, you can imagine we're studying geographic differences, um, we needed to have a national sample of people all across the country. Um, via these mechanisms of the, the computer interview, computer assisted interview and the in-home visit, um, we measured baseline risk factors, blood samples were drawn in the home and shipped to our laboratory at the University of Vermont for uh, storage and analysis. And the participants are followed up every six months by telephone to ascertain stroke, um, other cardiovascular outcomes, and cognitive function. The map on the right shows you where the participants live. The red dots represent white participants and the blue dots represent black participants. Uh, you can see there's a lot of people in the southeast. We oversampled on the southeast because we're studying uh, the southeastern stroke belt phenomenon, the higher risk of stroke mortality in the southeast and trying to figure out why that exists as well as why there are racial differences in stroke mortality. So when a participant told us they might have had a vascular event, um, there was adjudication by a committee of the medical records from that individual. The um, ascertainment of coronary events uh, was funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute via an R01 to Dr. Monica Safford at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. So her team uh, reviewed those records to validate the MI or coronary death events, and the analyses I'm gonna show you include 5.3 years of follow-up. Um, in this analysis, we excluded people who had baseline self-reported coronary disease or stroke, so really a primary prevention population. And over the course of the five years, there were 614 identified coronary heart disease events. Rather than measuring LPPLA2 in the entire 30,000 people, which would be uh, cost prohibitive and actually is not necessary to do this kind of study, we selected a sample of the 30,000. We call it a cohort random sample of nearly 4,000 individuals. And then we pulled the samples out of the freezer in the cohort sample and those who developed incident CHD and measured LPPLA2 activity. This was done by Diadexis using the new plaque test, um, and has, which has low CVs as you see here. We described the association of LPPLA2 with risk factors and used Cox proportional hazards models to um, calculate the relative risk or the hazard ratio of CHD by baseline LPPLA2. We divided the LPPLA2 distribution into quintiles, as I showed you on the previous slides for the other studies that were done. We also used the um, 80th percentile as a cutoff to define elevated LPPLA2. So we turned it into a binary variable as well. And we adjusted for the usual uh, cardiovascular risk factors that are listed on this slide and also for baseline statin use and baseline CRP. We used um, interaction testing to determine whether there were differences in associations of LPPLA2 with CHD by age, race, or sex. So this slide shows the risk factor levels by LPPLA2 category. Uh, again, we used the 80th percentile as a cutoff in this analysis. The distribution does differ by sex, and so we use sex-specific uh, percentiles to define this cutoff. So for men, it turned out to be 250 and for women, 200 nanomoles per minute per mil. You can see that age did not differ very much by LPPLA2 level. Um, and you can also see that blacks had uh, significantly lower levels um, of LPPLA2 than whites. So um, we're really interested in this study in understanding racial disparities. And this tells us that probably LPPLA2 is not involved in explaining the racial disparity because blacks have lower levels. Blood pressure was similar, diabetes was a little more common in those with low LPPLA2, smoking was similar, uh, as you might expect LDL is lower with lower LPPLA2, and statin use was more common among those with lower LPPLA2 because as you heard, um, statins will lower the level. As have been, has been shown in other studies, CRP did not differ by LPPLA2 level. <laughs> 
This shows the survival free from coronary disease during follow-up uh, with women in the blue lines and men in the green. The, dot, the dashed lines represent those with elevated LPPLA2. And you can see for both sexes there is separation of the curves um, such that those with higher LPPLA2 have a higher incidence rate of CHD. And of course, as you would also expect, men had a higher incidence than women. So here's the main results of this part, the hazard ratio of CHD by quintile of LPPLA2. So each higher quintile is compared to the bottom quintile and we calculate the, the hazard ratio with increasing quintiles. And really all of the action here was in the top quintile. So those in the top compared to the bottom quintile had a 40% higher risk of a first CHD event in this model with just adjustment for age, race, and sex. When we then add the coronary risk factors, there's really no confounding, a very small uh, reduction in the hazard ratio to 1.36. So this biomarker is um, really almost completely independent in its risk prediction for CHD in this study. We then add socioeconomic factors to the model, um, and again, really no, no confounding at all by socioeconomic factors. And finally, adding CRP to the model, not surprisingly, because CRP level didn't correlate with LPPLA2, it also does not uh, attenuate the hazard ratio at all. And finally, um, adding statin use, which surprised me a little bit. Statins uh, lower LPPLA2. I thought if we added statin use, it might attenuate the relationship a little bit, and it did not, um, which again suggests, independent of whether you're on a statin or not, uh, the biomarker is gonna be predictive of coronary disease. These are the p-values for the interaction. So the fact that all these p-values are high tells us there's no significant difference in the relationship of LPPLA2 with coronary disease by age, race, or sex. So the results are consistent across these subgroups. This shows the data, uh, the second way I told you I was gonna show you, by making the, the biomarker into a binary variable, so above or below the 80th percentile, uh, and in this case, the sex-specific 80th percentile. And you see across the series of models, uh, you see similar um, lack of confounding. So the relative risk is 1.6 in the uh, minimally adjusted model and very little confounding by the successive addition of the risk factors and um, baseline conditions that I described previously. So in the final model, you see a 1.5-fold increased risk or a 50% increased risk with LPPLA2 above the 80th percentile. Um, some of you may be familiar with using this assay in clinical practice. Um, the FDA-approved cut point, um, as determined in the, um, also in the regard study, was 225 nanomoles per minute per mil, and um, the relative risk we observed in these analyses were pretty identical uh, to the relative risk using that standard cut point uh, for men and women together. Um, because we're interested in racial differences, although the p-value for interaction was not significant, we ran the model with race stratification just to see what the numbers look like. And you see here um, consistent results across both race groups, um, uh, the relative risk being a little higher in whites compared to blacks at 1.59 compared to 1.32. But that difference is not statistically significant uh, based on that interaction term. So basically, you can be confident that when you measure uh, this biomarker um, in blacks and whites, you're gonna expect similar risk prediction. So the strengths of this study are that it's a very large prospective biracial cohort. Um, I'm not aware of other studies this large that have done this kind of work and can accumulate the large number of cases over a really short period of time. Um, we have careful adjudication of the events, so we know that our, our events are clean. And um, we were able to, in collaboration with Diadexis, use the automated activity assay, which is an advantage over prior studies because of its uh, low coefficient of variation and better reliability. Um, a limitation is that there's only a single measurement of LPPLA2. You know, anytime you measure a biomarker, there's measurement error that can be due to a lot of different factors. A person's value might change slightly over time. 
Um, it's always best if you can measure it more than once, um, at least in research settings, not always practical in clinical settings. But many of you know, as, if you're clinicians, that you don't always rely on the results from one test. Sometimes you have to repeat that to be more confident of what the person's real value is for that, for that biomarker. Now, I told you I would tell you about other diseases. Um, these are results from the um, Thompson meta-analysis for stroke, uh, looking at LPPLA2 activity and stroke. Um, so this included only seven studies as compared to the coronary um, endpoints uh, analyzed in this meta-analysis that included 17 or 18 studies. And uh, although it did include 1,400 events, and you can see the relative risk for the fifth quintile on the far right of 1.3. The results for mass were almost identical, so I'm not showing it here for simplicity. Um, in regards, at this point, we have uh, about 560 strokes, and we're going to be analyzing that data soon, um, hopefully uh, getting it published as well. What about other diseases? I think a lot about a variety of different diseases, and many of the chronic diseases of aging have uh, a certain component of uh, cardiovascular um, pathophysiology. And so we looked in the cardiovascular health study at LPPLA2 and the risk of dementia. So the cardiovascular health study is another observational cohort study. It included 5,000 um, or close to 6,000 um, individuals who were 65 and older when they were recruited in 1989 to 90 and followed over time. Dementia is well characterized in the cohort. So we have dementia classified as all type dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and vascular dementia. And you can see in these two graphs the relation of uh, increasing quartiles of baseline LPPLA2 and risk of dementia with mass on the left and activity on the right, again with the older generation assays. And you can see in these data that there's a suggestion of a relationship of the mass assay more so than the activity assay, um, really with both Alzheimer's and vascular dementia really a fascinating finding. Um, there is uh, a, probably, a, a, to some degree, an atherogenic um, origin to, to both types of dementia. Uh, so really fascinating data that really requires more work uh, to confirm in other studies. And what about other diseases? Um, these are data from a, a variety of papers from uh, studies, both the cardiovascular health study and the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis that I mentioned earlier. Um, looking at the relation of LPPLA2 mass and activity with different disease outcomes. So in the cardiovascular health study, the mass assay was predictive of congestive heart failure, while the activity assay uh, was not. Um, in the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, um, the mass assay was predictive of progression of kidney disease, while activity was not. Um, in the cardiovascular health study, um, the activity assay, but not the mass assay, was predictive of the risk of future diabetes in people without diabetes at baseline. I showed you the data for stroke um, and, the, and the data for dementia, where it may be a little bit unclear uh, due to power considerations in that study. We looked at this uh, a, a while ago in relation to risk of venous thrombosis, a disease that we don't think of as being as sharing the same risk factors as atherosclerosis. And uh, sure enough, as you might predict, there was absolutely no relation of LPPLA2 activity or mass with uh, the risk of future venous thrombosis, um, which is not surprising, but interesting. Um, and then peripheral artery disease is the other common major vascular disease, and we have uh, data in progress on that that hopefully you'll, I'll be able to share with you soon. So to conclude, um, LPPLA2 activity is a risk marker for first CHD. Um, the prior null results on predicting first CHD with the activity assay may have related to imprecision of non-automated assays. Associations in regar regards were robust in blacks and whites, in men and women, and across the age spe spectrum between 45 and 100 years old. Um, and we need more work on the epidemiology in relation to both CHD, predicting recurrent CHD, predicting other diseases, and the contributions of the activity and the mass assays conjointly uh, to risk prediction. I'd like to acknowledge the sources of funding for the data I've shared with you today. Uh, the NINDS, the National Institute of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, 
um, diadexis and uh, multiple regards investigators as well as MESA and CHS investigators that I've had the fortune of collaborating with over the last 15 years or so on this topic. Um, and these are some of the regards investigators on the top left, our group, um, the executive committee meeting down at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. On the bottom is the group at the University of Vermont, our investigators and technicians uh, celebrating the end of recruitment for the study, uh, processing and receiving uh, 30,000 individual samples one at a time uh, that have gone into 24 chest freezers. You can appreciate that. We have about 750 liters of fluids uh, from these participants. It's, it's really uh, an amazing resource. And on the top right, I think it's important for all of us who are uh, clinician scientists to acknowledge our clinical colleagues and the um, contributions they make to us being able to spend our time doing research. And so on the, on the top right is the uh, members of our thrombosis and hemostasis program at the University of Vermont Medical Center. And um, I couldn't be here today without their efforts uh, to care for our patient population uh, in Vermont and northern New York. Thank you for your attention.